Hello everybody, just wanted to start out the lecture with a joke here. Of course, I need to get some tests, but offhand, I'd say it's some sort of fungus infection. So we're going to talk about uh, workup and treatment of invasive fungal infections in immunosuppressed. My name is Aliyah Baluch, as noted there. I have no disclosures, so kind of like a pretest, kind of get your mind thinking here. How long is the fungal component held from a bronchialveolar lavage prior to being finalized? What is impure drug of choice for candidemia? Which azole antifungal is contraindicated to QTC is short? The goals of today's lecture is going to review the definition of invasive fungal infection, who is susceptible to fungal infections, kind of a review of current tools available for workup, looking at culture and other tools that are coming to the forefront in our microbiology labs, treatment for candida as well as fungus non-candida species. So. Fungal infections, why is this important? There's an innate high morbidity and mortality, and unfortunately this comes hand in hand with a paucity of symptoms in our patients other than being very sick. Candida species related infections especially kind of comes in two flavors. You have your invasive version, which is your bloodstream infections, and the non-invasive, more like I have thrush or I have uh, Canada yeast type of infection in uh, the vulva area of the body. Canada species uh, account for approximately 10% of our bloodstream infections in our ICU patients, and these candidemia unfortunately are associated with a crude in house mortality of up to 30%. What about fungal infections in hematopoietic stem cell transplant patients? In a single study, 12 year retrospective review, they had 92 cases of proven or probable infection. Uh, the most common for early uh, invasive fungal infection is Candida, versus the most common pathogen for late invasive uh, fungal infection is mold. The risk factors for invasive fungal infection in stem cell transplant patients, uh, as you can see here for early, um, is a history of previous invasive fungal infection, and there's also HLA mismatch, prolonged neutropenia, acute graft versus host disease. For a late invasive fungal infection, again, a history of invasive fungal infection, ongoing steroid use, CMV disease, and chronic GVHD. Here, our invasive fungal infection mortality is up to 53%, and for them, that the 12-year survival rate was about 42% if you had invasive fungal infection versus a much better survival rate of 63% if you were without invasive fungal infection. And just of note that the references are cited on each individual side as I'm citing items. There's a couple things that you have to be careful of or understand when you're looking at fungal papers is what are these definitions that they're talking about probable versus possible invasive fungal infection It's based on three main factors there's host factors clinical manifestation as well as the actual mycological um, evidence that you're getting from the laboratory there is this main paper cited here uh, the revised definitions of invasive fungal infections from the european organization uh, as as you can see, Dr. Bennett is the last author here. And then I just put in the snapshots of the main graphics talking about here, here, talking about proven invasive fungal infection, except for endemic mycosis. There's definitions here for the microscopic analysis from a sterile space for either mold versus yeast. And there's culture, blood, and that's if there's any applicability from serological samples for CSF, for example, cryptococcal antigen, the CSF would only be present for disseminated crypto, and this is for proven, as I mentioned there. But then there's a different table, table two, this is for probable, so you kind of think it, but you don't have quite as much stringent data to support it. These are host factors like being recently neutropenic or having received an allogenic stem cell transplant, the steroids, as I mentioned before, T-cell depression, using all our monoclonal antibodies become 
becoming more and more popular as well as having skids or inherited severe immunodeficiency problems. There's clinical criteria in different particular sites, like for example in your lungs, if you have the air crescent sign, this could be you know, one of your three signs on CT for lower respiratory infection. Again, table two is for probable invasive fungal disease. And actually with such a big table came into pieces that it goes on here, like for example, disseminate candidiasis, at least one of the following two entities within the previous two weeks that you had those target light or what I call cannonball abscesses in the liver or spleen and that you have progressive retinal exudates which can see in persistent candidemia. What about yeast versus mold? A couple words here that yeast are unicellular, oval, or round. They have a mycelial formation that's a fuzzy mat on the plate and they reproduce by budding. This is your stereotypical candida. Then you have mold that are thread like or filamentous in nature. They can be septated or aseptated. Traditionally, asexual reproduction via quinidia that then break off and then float off and replicate. Your stereotypical is aspergillus. Now there's a notation on the bottom talking about dimorphic yeast that they kind of fluctuate between different levels. Alright, and a couple other words about mold. Your stereotypical septae hyphae, this is aspergillus species, whereas your characteristic non septae hyphae that we are concerned about oftentimes in immunosuppressed patients is mucormycosis, previously known as zygomycosis. I created this cartoon to just go through on a stepwise manner. Where do our current drugs work? Here you have echinocannons like mycofungin, caspone, and dulofungin, also known as araxis. Its target is the glucan in the cell wall. Then you have polyenes on the right upper hand side, stereotypically your amphotericin B products. This target is against the ergosterol in cell membranes. And then you have triazoles, which are your voriconazole, posiconazole, fluconazole, also against ergosterol in the cell membrane. In the center, you have your pyrimidine analogs, like flucytosine, what we use in combination with amphotericin products for uh, specific CNS infections, and it works against nucleic acid synthesis. This is where you can see some of these drugs actually go against the same site, and I would give a word of caution that do not assume that if you're using two antifungals that they would be synergistic because it could be depleting the site that the other drug works at. Alright, so now we've gone over the definition of IFI and a couple of things about how to diagnose it and what drugs we use, who is susceptible. So risk factors for disseminated candidiasis, exposure to broad spectrum antimicrobials and knock off all the good stuff in the GI tract being on total parental nutrition, having received abdominal surgery, having a CVC in place, ICU patient, having diabetes or uncontrolled blood sugars. This is a neat graphic. That's from the 2009 paper from Marcy Tomlin. It's in the IDSA website for the guidelines for infectious complications among bone marrow transplant patients. It breaks it down to phase one. These are the infections at risk when you have mucositis, you've had recent chemotherapy. Then phase two is your post engraftment when you have ongoing impaired cellular or humoral immunity issues. This is oftentimes when you start having reactivation, you've lost your B cells and now your antibodies are waning. And then phase three, the late phase, when they still haven't really had a very robust cellular humoral immunity, CD4 cells come up very slowly and definitely your reactivation issues can be present at this time. The reason I bring this up is just showing that in terms of fungal infections, what is your first and premier issue is with candida from the get-go, whereas aspergillus traditionally you have to be neutropenic approximately 14 days before you have the increased risk for mold infections unless you've kind of shifted the timeline either because your patient's coming in already neutropenic or they've been heavily pretreated with steroids. And then here noted that from 2001 to 2006 in the U.S., overall one-year cumulative incidence of invasive fungal infections in allotransplants was 3.4%, but say if you were in a more immunosuppressed population as a subset being your 
match mismatch related donor could be as high as 8.1 percent this is the graphic from the same paper talking about how you know your neutrophils come up first once you've been grafted but unfortunately your cd4 cells can take up to years to kind of rebound or repopulate post transplant this is a similar graphic but from dr fishman's paper um talking about organ transplant patients similar or the same bugs but different timeline because their risk factors are along the top where you had a surgical intervention in the first month you're having risk related to you got someone else's organ in you you were in the hospital you were in the or you could have leaking issues um, then the second phase is from one month to six months you're still relatively close to your local site of having had your surgery but this is when you start first having your um, the, the need for prophylaxis to prevent reactivation of say pneumocystis or herpes virus and then once you pass six months a lot of this is your community acquired type of infections the reason I note this is that you can see here there's issues already between one and six months for fungal infections as well as for greater than six months they have risk for fungal infections as well so we talked about the WHO, now let's talk about how we prove it or the current tools available. So culture is our kind of backbone that we've been using, um, though it's definitely less in use now than it has been in the past. Blood cultures, often positive and less than 50% really, and that's just for regular blood cultures. And fungal blood cultures, we try to suppress the regular bugs so that we can allow our fungi to grow instead these are traditionally held for up to four weeks and then now there's new items with PCR going on the film array platform that you can have blood culture identification approximately one hour after your gram stain is positive so talking a little bit further about the film array blood culture ID panel and understand this is just an example there are multiple different PCR platforms or multiplex platforms that are coming to the forefront if you go to the national meetings they have all their different sites that you can go and look at their different machines and we'll find out what are the pluses and minuses of each set but this is an example that's present at our facility so I just wanted to go through it that there's these little pouches that you have you inject a hydration solution and then as you can see from the third cartoon you inject a sample it's not very um, specific about you know you can only pipette so many cc's it's you can you know be plus or minus a couple cc's you then put it in the film array machine you start the run and then you can see there's two pcr bits that it goes through and then as the graphic shows you have the cell lysis the purification pcr1 pcr2 and then the best part is that after a mere two minutes of hands-on time that you have a turnaround of one hour and then it spits out it reviews 27 different targets on the blood culture ID panel now not all of them are a specific type of bug you can see here on the far left there's a list of gram positives then there's a list of gram negatives yeast this is why it's in this particular lecture is there's a number of different yeast that it looks for and then three main resistance mechanisms it also looks for so whenever you have a new test you want to make sure well does it work is it really worth the money so this was a, a paper that was reviewing the film array blood culture ID panel it looked at 206 blood culture bottles that were analyzed the key thing with this is that it had about 92 percent identification of monomicrobial growth obviously if it's not in the panel the panel is not going to catch the microorganism which is what the second bullet is about and then what was really nice was about 3.6% um, of the runs actually detected an additional microorganism compared to the blood culture at a very low rate of being invalid and thus bottom line was actually that the film array was very good in that it, the results were reproducible which is very important when you are say on a panel evaluating what's the new big machine you're going to get in your micro lab you want to have a machine that's results are very reproducible independent of who's running the the series of the labs
There are other options like the Molotov here. Molotov is very popular actually in Europe, a little bit slower to pick up here in uh, the United States. The idea is that it identifies protein fingerprints. Unfortunately, the same issue with the multiplex PCR, you get an answer, this is your ID, but you still have no susceptibility issues. So you still have to culture it out if it's, say, a blood culture to figure out what antibiotics you can use. In terms of yeast, there's actually additional prep steps that are needed for the Molotov in order to figure out um, what is the identification of the yeast. This is a graphic just showing that you know, if you start along the blue line at the top, you have colonization with a small amount of candida. And then as you say, perhaps get more antibiotics, you're selecting out for more yeast, it kind of, you have more and more, you go from low grade um, type of colonization to high grade colonization, then you have invasive infection. And the idea is that as you go along this continuum, the biomarkers start to become positive, as well as if you're looking for testing that's looking at candida DNA, they will also become positive, just trying to give us more options for diagnosing candida invasive infection prior to, say, um, we would have otherwise. So talk about the DNA sequencing, there's also items called semi-nest PCRs for the detection of candida species specific DNA. There's also the use of mannin or anti-mannin antibodies understanding that mannin is a component of candida species cell wall and that there's an example the platelia candida antigen test that's an ELISA the sensitivity though is 58 percent but the specificity can go up to 93 percent in ICU patients but you do have to be careful depending on your patient population like here's an example in non-immunosuppressed patients there's an increased sensitivity and specificity if you get the mannin and anti-mannin antibodies together you get your sensitivity up to 83 and your specificity up to 86 percent what about hepatosplenic candidiasis this is definitely a big issue for morbidity and mortality in neutropenic patients um, and traditionally is a diagnosis via imaging. You do an ultrasound or a CT MRI, but mainly ultrasound, you see kind of like this moth-eaten per perspective of the organ, and then you're like, oh, well, this is hepatosplenic candidiasis. So uh, this paper was citing that mannin or anti-mannin positive test was a median of 16 days prior to the radiological findings of liver or splenic lesions. Note though that this is actually not necessarily in common practice. This is a specific paper that was looking at its possible use in our neutropenic patient population. But at least it does, 16 days is a big difference. What about species issues with mannins and anti -mannins? Uh that does it work equally for everything? It doesn't, unfortunately. It is very sensitive for albicans, glabrata, and tropicalis, but it drops down for candida parapsilosis or candida cruzi. Other tools, there are antimycelial antibodies. They have an immunofluorescence assay. There's a candida albicans germ 2 specific antibody, CAGTA. There's limited clinical studies, though. You can see there's a range for sensitivity and specificity. Again, depending on your patient population, you're reviewing the testing for. What about 1,3-beta-D-glucan? There are a number of different facilities that use this. This is a component of cell wall of most fungi. No, it is not for zygote or for cryptococcus species. There are actually four different commercial kits for this. An example would be Fungotel, which I see often in our hospital hospital transfers using this testing. The sensitivity is 77%, specificity is 85% in ICU patients with proven or probable invasive fungal infections. Still going on with 1,3-beta do glucan you do have to be aware there are a certain number of things that cause false positives whether it's the recent use of albumin or immunoglobulins which is a big issue for for example bone marrow transplant patients they're often getting immunoglobulins on a routine basis if they're on hemodialysis there are certain um, dialysis uh, filters that can have false positives recent abdominal surgery the use of beta lactam antibiotics which is very widespread or actually having gram-positive bacteremia. 
What is important to note that does not affect your rate of positivity is actually the use of antifungals. The galactamin in itself, now this is a polysaccharide that's a major component of specifically aspergillus cell wall. It can be found in other fungi except the mucor mucorous uh, family. Uh, it can be quantitative or qualitative. I would recommend if you're going to do it to have a quantitative so you can follow it if it becomes positive. The specificity is at 84%, but it's a lower sensitivity in organ transplant patients compared to bone marrow transplant patients. Just kind of a comparison here for a couple specific bugs. Cryptococcus neoformans has a lower amount of antigen for 1,3-beta D-glucan compared to candida. It can cross-react with the galactomannan. Rhodoturula, this has two-thirds of the antigen compared to candida species, and pneumocystis can also cross-react um, with 1,3-beta D-glucan. All right, so we went over tools. What about treatment now? Because there's a couple key things that are changing. So first you need to know what species you have. So this was just looking at the path alliance. You can see the majority of our candidemias are candida albicans followed by candida glabrata and then from there. So what about drug of choice empirically? You're going to be looking at echinocandin depending on what's your formulary for your hospital, caspo, mica, and niladula fungin. So say if you have ca uh, candida albicans, you know it already in hand, or parapsilosis or tropicalis, you can use high dose fluconazole, you can start high, and then depending on your scenario, drop down to 400 milligrams. Candida glabrata, uh, really it kind of can unless you have data for vori or fluke. And then the same thing for Canada Cruza, you should be using echinocandins unless you have other data for voriconazole. This was a different type of uh, graphic, again, taken from the Stanford. It has a nice uh, spectra of activity. I just translated it into a graphic here, talking about how, for example, Candida cruzi does not have any coverage for um, fluconazole. But another point to make, Canada parapsilosis and Canada gear mundi tends to have much higher MIC from echinocandins. And then, of course, Candida lusitania does not have any coverage with amphotericin B products. So what about duration? The impure therapy is considered approximately 14 days. This is from your first negative blood culture. You should have a lack of an abscess because, again, whenever you have an abscess, whether it's bacteria or fungal, you need to cut it open, drain it because our drugs have trouble entering inside an abscess where it's acidotic. You have to prove that there is lack of disseminated infection, again, a nidus that you cannot get into. Uh, your patient should be improving in order to pick a duration, again, otherwise you're looking for a deep-seated source, and that you should have source control. So if you have a central venous catheter, it should be removed because it's an outside element and very easy to create a biofilm and you won't be able to clear the infection appropriately. What about antifungal stewardship? And you're like, oh, well, I've heard of antimicrobial stewardship, but there is actually something to be said about antifungal stewardship. Then now with these non-culture diagnostics, is they were designed to improve the diagnosis of invasive candidiasis, but there's something to be said about using it to kind of de-escalate faster or to finish your treatment faster, or maybe they don't actually need treatment. There's an observational prospective trial um, from 2012 to 2014 using these two different tests mentioned. They were looking at biomarkers, um, if any, were on days 0, 3, and 5, or 5, and then the model 2 were if they were positive with at least two consecutive tests, and what they found was that for proven invasive candidiasis, 56.7% in non-ICU patients versus 14.3% in ICU patients, that 70% were on echinocandins, and that the median duration of antifungals was 10 days with, you can see, the interquartile range. And the idea was trying to use it to go for de-escalation. If you had a negative CAGTA and a 1,3-beta D-glucan, then on day 5 of empiric therapy, that you could actually have deceived your antifungals in approximately 53% of your patients with no infection, and you would have had a sensitivity of 97%.
It is definitely worthwhile to discuss and consider for future use as these tests become better. So what about treatment of fungus non-candida? So there's voriconazole, your amphotericin B products, whether it be fungazone, ambazone, abelset. Again, traditionally, each hospital has one of them on formulary. Posoconazole, and then you have isovariconazonium. Um, this is the newest drug on the block. Uh, the original name was going to try to be isovariconazole, but FDA asked for isovariconazonium. The brand name is also known as Crescemba. So invasive fungal infections in hematopoietic stem cells transplants, you still have, you know, candida up at the front, but then you're followed by aspergillus, mucormycosis, and fusarium. Aspergillus is our second most common invasive fungal infection. Your drugs of choice are voriconazole and amphotericin B products. For mucormycosis, third common invasive fungal infection drug of choice, amphotericin B products. You also have uh, the posoconazole and the isovariconazonium. Now, no, with mucor, your patient is also supposed to be evaluated for surgical intervention or debridement. Fusarium, this is your fourth common invasive fungal infection. Drug of choice is the ampho. You can also consider vori or posa for cleanup afterwards. And then also, as noted before, surgical debridement, if possible, decrease in immunosuppression if it's like an, a transplant type of patient, if possible. This is because I like graphics, um, uh, kind of showing your vori versus posa versus isovariconazonium versus ampho. Note, contraindicated prolonged QTC, these are our original triazoles, posa and vori. Contraindicated with short QTC, this is our new one, this is the isovariconazonium. Hallucinations, approximately 30% of our vori patients. Personally, whenever I give vori, I counsel them. I warn them that some people will complain of about an hour after having their dose, the lights get brighter, but then it goes down. And I tell them that's okay. The problem is, of course, if the light problems or the hallucinations continue to progress, that's something else. They need to call us for reevaluation of the dosing. Now, nephrotoxicity for all formulations, this is going to be your amphotericin B products, uh, especially if not adequately pre and post hydrated. Nephrotoxicity for IV formulation only. Cyclodextrin is the big issue with the voriconazole if IV. Drug level monitoring recommended, mainly the data is for voriconazole. Drug drug interactions, this has to do with the enzymes and this is for all the azoles mentioned here so the voriconazole, posoconazole, and isovariconazonium photosensitivity rash, voriconazole is a big one this is why I tell my patients please when they're on the vori be very judicious with their time outside they should be wearing sunscreen transaminitis because again of how the drugs are broken down Vori versus Posa versus Isovariconazonium. And then there's more and more data in the last couple years about fluorid accumulation. This is going to present in a patient, usually on prolonged voriconazole exposure because of the side chain that has the fluoride. They're going to present with joint pain, maybe joint swelling, excuse me, some periosteal lifting. Uh, thankfully, I've only seen this a couple times. Uh, thus far, but it's more common um, for patients, probably in the outpatient finding where they're not just on Vori for three months, but maybe for one year or longer. What about fungal resistance patterns? We talk about this in bacteria, uh, but it you can definitely see it's a relatively new and hot topic for fungi because it's a 2015 paper. Overall candida species resistance, we're now looking at up to 6% for fluke and Vori. Candida glabrata with fluke resistance were up in a very short period of time of three years, up to 12%. And unfortunately, Aspergillus fumigatus with vori resistance, we're seeing up to 6% of our isolates. Definitely at my facility, we're seeing the fumigatus issue. I think part of the problem is the skewing of the data that not necessarily all Aspergillus samples are being sent for evaluation of resistance but definitely there are clinical cases where we're seeing more and more patients that perhaps have been exposed to vori multiple times that when they do have aspergillus it's already been pre-exposed so then you're 
ability for having resistance goes up. What about multi-drug resistant candida? This was a bit of a scary story that isolates from India, Japan, and Korea uh, for candida auris. Um, all isolates were resistant to fluke, 11 of them were resistant to voriconazole, 7 isolates were also resistant to flucytosine, 5 of them had elevated MICs to caspofungin, and 28.6% of them had breakthrough fungemia. Ultimately, 4 patients had full therapeutic failures. Just a couple key scenarios I was going to go over here. So, talk about cryptococcus, it's a yeast. What happens is in patients with impaired cellular immunity, uh, you have the increased risk for cryptococcal infection. Historically, uh, you know, our exam board questions makes you think about like HIV patients. You can have presentation in, blood in, in the blood that's up to 55%, our neurological infections up to 33%, you can have isolated in the lungs up to 11%. Your special test for cryptococcus, like the cryptococcal antigen, note though, uh, in non-neoformans, non gadii these tests don't work quite as well. The treatment, amphotericin B plus flucytosine, or in certain uh, either after the induction or in resource poor areas, you might see the use of high dose fluconazole also. This is a beautiful graphic, as you can see cited below. This is talking about rotatorula. This is a red yeast, it's an opportunity. Uh, opportunistic yeast infection increased incidence in those with CVCs or heme disorders, AIDS, extensive burns, IV drug use, ICU patients. It appears in patients who are often maybe were on suppressive or treatment with fluke in the kind of cannons and it breaks through. The diagnosis actually blood culture uh, will be positive in 70% of systemic infections. It is susceptible to amphotericin B products and flucytosine. It is intrinsically resistant to fluconazole and echinocannins, hence you know, it will break through because or be selected out because it's resistant. And but also no it has high MICs, the vorium posoconazole, making that less of an advantageous choice for treatment. Then another beautiful graphic here, and we're talking about pneumocystis. This is an opportunistic fungal infection. It was redesigned as that in 1988. Stereotypically, your HIV AIDS patient with CD4 count less than 200. Immunosuppressed patients like solid organ transplant or hematopoietic stem cell transplant recipients, perhaps not on appropriate prophylaxis, or they have breakthrough on their uh, prophylaxis regimen. Diagnosis, so you can have 1,3-beta D-glucan, as I mentioned earlier, but they don't actually have ergesterol. You can do a GMS cyst stain, a GIMSA organism stain, or there are certain immunological stains like using the FITC monoclonals or colometric enzyme label monoclonal. Treatment for pneumocystis, if you're not critically ill and your oxygenation is relatively good, you're going to use trim sulfa or, you know, Bactrim type products, two double strength tabs, PO, Q8 hours for 21 days. Now note, if there's actually data to support, if you're not HIV positive with pneumocystis, you can be treated for 14 days, but if you look at uh, most guidelines, they just mention the 21 days. Now if you are critically ill and you have low oxygenation, then uh, the prednisone is required prior to starting your therapy with the trim sulfa as mentioned before. Now of course this is if you have pristine kidneys, you have to dose adjust if you have AKI or chronic kidney disease. Uh, this was a slide uh, taken from Dr. Pasakova talking about pneumocystis presentation of infection in HIV population versus HIV negative population. Because there's some key elements to be noted for pneumocystis, like for example, the HIV population because you have a kind of dulled immune system, you have gradual pneumocystis, could be up to two weeks for you to have symptoms really don't have that much respiratory insufficiency, you have a huge load of pneumocystis in your lungs, and you have a little bit of neutrophils, you might have some fever or cough, you definitely have more chest or pleuritic chest pain, and definitely you have more of the wasting where you have weight loss, mortality is up to 20%. Whereas you take the same organism, the pneumocystis in an HIV negative patient, comes on very quick, you get sick very fast, you have 
actually a small load of organisms, you have more neutrophils, more of a reaction, which unfortunately allows you to have a higher rate of death up to 60%. And that was just, I found very interesting was the amount of load on a bronch. So a word on the ideal antifungal, if I could have one, the spectrum of activity would be wide, your toxicity would be minimal, we wouldn't have any infusion related reactions like we have with amphotericin products, you wouldn't have the nephrotoxicity issues, I wouldn't have any hepatotoxicity issues, and I definitely wouldn't want any electrolyte wasting issues notoriously like with ampho. Minimal drug-drug interactions as we see with our triazoles, and of course in my ideal world World, I want oral and IV and ideally the same price and in talking about price because of fungals we want it to be low price so we've gone all of those those different items so in conclusion invasive fungal infection has a high morbidity and mortality occurs in our ICU diabetic patients immunosuppressed persons we have the ability to do cultures and biomarkers. We use them to help start therapy. I would ask you to think about using them to stop therapy. And of course, in terms of big ideas, you know, we have a lot of echinocannons. We use quite a bit of voriconazole, especially for aspergillus, as well as the use of amphotericin. So kind of going full circle to the post-test. So how long is the fungal component from a bronch held it's for four weeks. What's the impaired drug of choice for candidemia? It's an echinocandin. What azole antifungals contraindicators? The QTC is short. It's isoviroconazonium. And of course, as always, my acknowledgments are to our patients, our staff, and our anti um, uh, antimicrobial stewardship group called SMART. And this is just a picture of all of us celebrating, and of course the whole SMART team, which of course, as mentioned, is infection prevention, the doctors, the pharmacists, and the microbiology lab. And thank you. If you have any questions, uh, please contact me. And this was just a neat graphic that I just wanted to talk about. These testing, they're not cheap either. So the actual film array platform is 39500 per this paper. Reagents can be approximately 129 per sample. But it can be used in machine for other items. For example, the respiratory panel, a GI panel, which decreases your need then for like stool cultures. And then there's still pending FDA approval at this time uh, for a meningitis panel. Thank you.